So GarageBand is frequently written off as kind of a low powered toy for kids without any merit to actually using it to produce professional music. While I think it does have its flaws, I think it's quite interesting as a concept and deserves further investigation. In fact, I think GarageBand is actually better than anything we used to have two decades ago when recording professional music in a studio as it's been upgraded massively since its release in 2004. Of course, if you're looking to find a workstation to have a music career in, you're probably better off picking something else, but that doesn't mean GarageBand isn't a useful tool. It's actually quite powerful and can 100% be used to create good, listenable music. So much so that people who aren't producers probably couldn't tell you made your project in GarageBand. Let's break down the case for GarageBand and go back to 2004 to look at how it evolved over time and why I still think it's a useful product. Now, if you've already watched my video about the history of Logic, which if you haven't, I'll shamelessly request you go do that before you continue this video, you'll know that GarageBand is sort of a subset of the Logic workstation and is a more beginner-friendly, stripped-down version of Logic Pro. GarageBand was created by Apple originally, but its older brother Logic actually has a deep history dating back to the early 90s under the name Notator Logic. I mention this because while GarageBand was created by Apple, the direction of the program was led by Dr. Gerhard Lengling, who is a former employee of the German company eMagic purchased by Apple, which is when Logic was taken over by Apple. In January of 2004, Steve Jobs announced GarageBand at the Macworld Expo assisted by none other than John Mayer to show off the capabilities of this new project. One of the best parts about this announcement is that because it was a consumer grade product, it was included with every single Mac purchase free of charge. It presents itself as a perfect starting point for someone who may not have a career in music but wants to create some basic background music for a YouTube video or simply just mess around with it since it's so easy to use. To rewind a bit though, I think it's important to cover the environment in which GarageBand was created in. In 1998, the iMac catapulted Apple back into the home computing market and was a major success for non-professional computer users. During this time period, Apple had been steadily increasing the stockpile of software for the iMac, such as iMovie, iTunes, iPhoto, or even Final Cut Pro to make it more appealing to consumers. It was especially important to Apple at this time to hit home the fact that their platform was for the creative person, and to have an app that allowed even the most unskilled person to create their own music was a win in Apple's eyes. Since Apple had acquired eMagic only two years earlier, and along with it the Logic Workstation, it left them with a music workstation too complex for the average person to get any use out of. This combined with their philosophy stated earlier led to the creation of GarageBand striking the perfect balance between the ability to create great music without needing to have so much experience in the field. Gerhard, as stated before, spearheaded this new product and was tasked with simplifying the Logic DAW and on the other end came up with GarageBand as we know it today, albeit back then it was a lot less powerful than it is now. The early versions were still impressive though, as from the start it supported MIDI, digital instruments via the AU platform that Apple made, and digitized audio recording. It's important to note here that many other companies have tried to create stripped down versions of their own programs for beginners, but none worked as well as GarageBand, and that's due to one simple fact. Apple had kept the underlying engine from Logic and all of its capabilities, but instead focused entirely on the user experience and interface to be the things that changed between Logic and GarageBand. I think this is why it succeeded in the way that it did and why it's beloved by so many people, amateur and professional alike. However, it did have some limitations imposed on users that were criticized, but in my opinion can be forgiven because it was never meant to replace a professional recording studio. You could record on 64 tracks, and its output and processing was limited to 16-bit. Nothing to write home about, but it was enough to work with. Impressively, they included over 50 stock instruments to choose from if you weren't playing your own, which was perfect for the beginner to use. On top of that, they'd offer over a thousand different loops and samples within the product, like drums or melodies, to get you started. Not only that, but GarageBand supported dynamic tempo and pitch for each loop adjusting to your project, which while pretty standard now, was a big deal at the time. As for effects, they'd include 200 different digital audio effects like EQ, reverb, and all of the other usual suspects. All of this together sort of made for the perfect storm for a low-key product to come out on top, and like I mentioned before, it was free for any iMac user and still is to this day. 
As we covered earlier at the 2004 Macworld Expo, it was exciting at the time to see a professional musician like John Mayer do a live presentation with Steve Jobs on stage and prove that GarageBand was not only easy to use, but could output some great quality music. Something else pretty neat that was advertised was the fact that you could plug your guitar directly into your Mac and select from a wide range of digital guitar amps to get the specific type of sound that you wanted. Something guitar players often cite as a reason for using older analog amplifiers is that they create this magical type of sound that can really only be generated by these analog products. However, I think that the digital offerings of GarageBand provide a happy medium emulating some of the older hardware that guitar players love. It's opinion time though, and that is that the original GarageBand looked kinda goofy. They had this weird wooden aesthetic they were going for on the interface with buttons and highlights. I understand why they did this to differentiate it from its older brother, but it sort of looks like those cars from the 90s that had wood panels on the outside, and thank god those went out of fashion. Currently though, GarageBand's look has been cleaned up substantially, looking much more modern and less cheesy. Although I do sort of have a soft spot for older programs that went their own way in terms of aesthetics. Anyways, all of these features and bundled instruments prove that GarageBand was most certainly not a low-powered amateur program and was much better than any other introductory software at the time. Fast forward one year and GarageBand 2 would be announced in January of 2005, again at the Macworld Expo with some notable upgrades. One of which being the ability to view and edit your music and musical notation so that you could visually represent what you were playing with sheet music. You'd also get the ability to record on more than one track at a time with 8 track recordings supported in GarageBand 2. Over the next few years, we'd see a bunch of new things added, mostly focused on features rather than underlying engine upgrades, because as we covered previously, GarageBand was already running on the Logic platform, which has been touted as one of the greats in the industry. In GarageBand 3, we'd see some non-music focused additions like the Podcast Studio feature. This came with over 200 different effects and jingles to use, like making your voice sound clearer or less boxy. I think this is important to highlight here, as if you're not experienced with audio engineering, you'd be pretty hard pressed to get a good result from a regular EQ. And having all these presets to work with make it a lot easier for beginners to get a nice sounding podcast with little effort. This is a common theme in GarageBand, providing a lot of tools to people without much experience to still see fantastic output from the program. As we'd covered previously, I don't really mind this because GarageBand isn't meant as a replacement for a powerful and professional grade workstation and is made for the everyman. A lot of people levy criticisms about this aspect of GarageBand, but I think it misses the point of the product. Steve Jobs was quoted as saying that the product needs to be for anyone and everyone, and that's exactly what it is. Another thing that would come along here is Apple's introduction of jam packs, which are bundles of virtual instruments and loops meant as expansions to the stock sounds that the program offers. I don't have much experience with these myself, as I was never a GarageBand user at this time, and still don't touch it very often, but it is a thoughtful addition. I think they're great for people not wanting to mess around with trying to find third-party AU-compatible plugins or instruments, since Apple's mission with their products is to have everything you need within the program itself. Over the years, we'd see a ton of these packs added, like choir, remix packs, orchestral sounds, drums, and so on. In GarageBand 4, we'd see more musical tools added, like being able to record different sections of your song independently, like a hook, intro, or bridge. We'd also finally see tempo automation, which was lacking in previous iterations. Another nice addition for beginners was the Magic GarageBand feature, which allowed users to easily build backing tracks with visual representations of instruments to clearly see what was going on. We'd also get the ability to export iPhone ringtones from GarageBand as Apple is known for tight integration between their products. Version 5 would see some cool options for guitar players with a virtual stomp box pedal board and some more virtual amplifiers which could be used on the new electric guitar track. One smart thing Apple did here was make GarageBand projects compatible with the Logic Workstation, so if you started off learning in GarageBand and wanted to move on to a more complex workflow, you could continue working on previous projects within Logic. The new Arrange Track is an amazing feature as well, which lets you easily drag different sections of your arrangement around, if for instance you wanted a chorus section you'd already written to play before the verse or something like that. Project templates would also come in version 5, alongside a redesign of the interface, phasing out some of the more outdated aesthetics of the program. 24-bit processing was also introduced, which fought against the narrative that GarageBand was not capable of creating professional-grade music. 
We'd also see some hardware come out created by M Audio made specifically for the program. Their eye control MIDI device was made with the purpose of controlling parameters within GarageBand like panning, volume, or EQing and got officially partnered with Apple. Version 6 would have us graced with Flex Time, which is a staple in Logic nowadays and is a powerful retiming tool for samples as well as tempo matching. Another tertiary feature would be the How Did I Play function, which tells you how accurate you were at playing an instrument, which was a great learning tool for beginners. It would even track your progress so you could see how far you'd come from when you started, and I think more programs would do well with features like this. About a year later, with the advent of the iPhone and iPad, GarageBand would become available on iOS devices in November of 2011. I personally am not very big into mobile platforms when it comes to music creation, but I completely see the vision they had with this, as many other workstations have created similar products. It could be used for creating rough drafts, trying a different workflow, or for someone who had an idea on the go but didn't have access to a Mac at the time. During this time period, GarageBand took a more minimal approach to its design, looking a lot more similar to Logic, which I'm definitely a fan of. And now we reach the modern day, where GarageBand is generally well received by its users and is a great addition to the sea of products out there to make music. Whether you think it's a dinky little program for beginners or a real contender in the music production world, it's definitely clear that the GarageBand had a big impact and I'm glad Apple decided to continue supporting it. If you want to participate in the composition challenge, just join the Squash Discord, link in the description. Thank you guys for watching, stay safe out there, and I'll see you in the next video.